it is with a sense of duty and honour that I stand here today in the House to support uh, this motion to set up a committee to review Canada's actions during the evacuation of Canadian personnel, civilians and our Afghan friends and allies from Kabul, those that got out. As a former Associate Minister of National Defence, I want to say that my heart goes out to those 40,000 Canadians and their families who served in Afghanistan and to our ill, injured and most importantly our fallen, who made the ultimate sacrifice for Canadians so that among other victories, little girls could go to school in peace in Afghanistan, not fear acid being thrown in their faces or being married off at the age of nine. Have we forgotten the attempted murder of Malala by the Taliban in Pakistan when she spoke up for the education of girls? Like some Canadians who served during the Afghan mission, the Afghan war, I want to say how profoundly saddened I was to watch Canada strike our colours and run from Kabul, leaving many Afghan friends and allies behind, along with their families, and left to the Taliban to decide their fate. The victory of Vimy, the 100 days of D-Day and Kapiong, if they were able they would have cried out in rightful indignation at the scenes at the airport and of Canada's final retreat. For me and many friends and colleagues, it was a week of feeling frustrated, weak and sickened by this government's half-hearted approach that can be summed up by last in and first out. To be clear, I have nothing but praise for the professionalism of the Canadian Embassy staff and our Canadian Armed Forces personnel, particularly our Special Forces, that were left to hold the bag for this Liberal government. I only wish that they would get the love and support they need from this government in terms of modern equipment, but that is not the Liberal way. It apparently is not this Liberal government's way. As a former minister, you get to see how decisions are made behind closed doors and get an idea about the battle rhythm of a crisis and a response to it. Canada's response has been slow, overly bureaucratic, risk averse and without any real political leadership to get things done. You could see the dithering at the highest levels of this Liberal government because we were in a lead up to an election, Mr. Speaker, and then into an election that they thought they had in the bag. To put it simply, the government shamefully had its eyes on a majority government at a pivotal time and couldn't have cared less about the national interest or the human tragedy unfolding thousands of kilometres away in Afghanistan. Canadians have the right to know what the government did do in the run-up to the fall of Kabul and what they did afterward. The peace treaty with the Taliban was signed on February 29, 2020, and later on April 14, 2021, the Biden administration announced its intention to withdraw from Afghanistan by September 11. And I will be splitting my time with the member for uh, Charlesburg, Haute Saint Charles. Close enough. <sighs> if February 29th didn't ring any bells in Ottawa at the Prime Minister's office, or Privy Council office, or Global Affairs, or National Defence, or Citizenship and Immigration, there can be no question that alarm bells should have been ringing on April 14th with a clear end date set for September 11th. What did the Liberal government do when the United States administration announced their planned withdrawal? Did they strike an interdepartmental committee of deputies? Did they lay out plans for an all-of-government response? Did they send a reconnaissance team to Kabul to look at the logistics of getting thousands of Canadians and their Afghan allies out of the country? Did they lean ahead and start evacuations? of, say, our Afghan embassy staff and interpreters, likely the easiest to clear, and get them and their families out. It looks like this government was like a deer caught in the headlights and did nothing. Had there been any action, the government would, no doubt, have stood on soapboxes across the nation to announce the news, but instead chose to do nothing. And this is the point. It was a choice. 
This government had months to plan, marshal its resources, lean forward, and to carry out evacuations with the Afghan government and U.S. military still in control of the country. They did not do it. Then between May to July 2021, the Taliban started to make gains on the ground in Afghanistan. Predictable gains. As U.S. forces started to withdraw, as money dried up for pay of the Afghan army, as America withdrew the logistics consultants that kept the Afghan Air Force flying and the Afghan army's vehicle fleets moving. The Canadian government has access to the same intelligence as our allies and could have speeded up their evacuation operations then. Did we reach out to the Pakistani government or the military and ask them for assistance? Knowing that the tide was turning on the ground, what did the Liberal government do to get our people, our friends and our allies out? Where was our logistics hub? Why was there not a search capacity in place to process visa applications? Almost a month after, on July 23rd, the government announced their so-called path to protection. Path to protection indeed. Almost as soon as the path to protection was announced, the government was running in the opposite direction and jettisoned their 72-hour application deadline. Let's look at timelines. Four months after Biden announced the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the first evacuation flight out of Kabul lands in Canada. August 10th, the Taliban now controls 65 percent of Afghanistan, and the second and third largest cities, Kandahar and Herat, have fallen. August 13th, Canadian officials announced a plan to resettle 20,000 Afghan refugees, including interpreters, activists, women leaders, and members of the LGBT community. Two days later, Kabul falls to the Taliban and the Haqqani network. The death squads start to prowl the streets, going house to house to kill people who put their and their family safety aside to work with Canadian diplomats, aid workers, and soldiers. August 17th, two more flights get out with embassy staff and Afghan interpreters. While death squads are running, roaming the streets looking for our people, the Prime Minister says he won't give the Taliban diplomatic recognition. August 20th, Canadian officials managed to stop COVID testing and waive passports for refugees. August 26th, we witnessed two bomb blasts by suicide bombers at the airport and the Liberal government, in an election morass, pulls the plug. The evacuation ends. Our ambassador was out 11 days previous. Wouldn't it be interesting to see the correspondence between Privy Council, Global Affairs and National Defence? Can you imagine what the Prime Minister's office was saying to people about taking no unnecessary risks? All this time, innocent Afghans who who took us at our word, are seen falling from the landing gear of transport aircraft in desperation to leave and find safety, all the while the Liberal government is playing for time with the media and the electorate. We, could, we can stay after the Americans leave. We will get them out by land. We will evacuate them from regional partner countries like China, Russia, Iran and Pakistan. All smoke and mirrors. All a great game to protect the Liberal Party of Canada and its interests over the national interest and literally human life. Where are their priorities? How many refugees did the Liberal government rescue? 3,600 with another 1,200 trans in transit. First their target was 20,000 refugees. Now it's 40,000. These are targets, not reality. In 2006, during conflict in Lebanon, the Conservative government, with less time and warning, evacuated 15,000 Canadian citizens from that war-torn country. It acted with leadership, alacrity and dispatch. Quite a contrast to this government, Mr. Speaker. As a former Associate Minister of National Defence, I want to say uh, sorry, um, that we cannot forget our allies in times of need. We simply cannot. Words with no plan are useless and are costing lives. A special committee and its recommendations are absolutely necessary to streamline bureaucracy and show both compassion and agility. Priorities, Mr. Speaker. Priorities. Thank you. Yes.